Hey, Jesse, this is Alec from Orlando. Happy 1,000 episodes. Uh, I think it's amazing that you've been able to do this for so long and continue to find people uh, who uh, want to talk Bruce. And I think it's, in my opinion, the most positive podcast or pretty much any type of fan-related uh, show regarding Bruce Springsteen. I think, uh, you know, so many other ones can be very informative, but sometimes uh, – aren't aren't always so positive where you always I, I think bring positivity even when you don't like something you're not mean about it and I I, I actually truly believe that you've probably converted more people uh, to being Bruce fans through what you've done than through any of the other uh, uh, Bruce related sites that usually fans just find and uh, argue over so uh, I think uh, you've done great I'm looking forward to the next 1000 and just wanted to thank you and once again happy 1000 episodes bye this has happened increasingly over the last few tours. Like the set lists do feel a little bit basic. Um, and that's like, it's not a serious criticism. It's like for hardcore fans, you'd really like to see some oddities in there. And uh, I think that probably the second leg of the tour will get some oddities, but like you also know that the vast majority of people who are going to a Springsteen show do not care that you know prove all night and born to run and, and you know their favorite songs uh have been on every set list since 1981 and they just want that song that night Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson. I have a return guest. Russ Burlingame is one of my favorite guests because when Russ visits, we talk Bruce, we talk comics, we talk TV, we <laughs> talk about everything. Russ, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing I'm good how about you i am good i am uh i am we're going to talk bruce first i yeah. i was i had tickets for four shows but i ended up getting covid after the austin show so i had to miss tulsa but i did get to go to dallas houston and austin so i made the the texas hat trick have you gotten to go yeah. to a show yet no, uh, I've honestly, it's just a, a a thing of scheduling and money and all that stuff that happens when you've got kids of of a young age. Yes, uh, I have tickets to the show in Syracuse. Uh, I was going to try to go to Buffalo, which is next week. Uh, I just couldn't uh, find anybody to go with me, uh, and and it comes down to that thing of like. I don't own a car uh, I because I've been working from home for 15 years. And so at a certain point, it's like I can't take my wife's because she works at five in the morning. And so it's just that thing of like, OK, so at what point is it too much work to get to like take a bus out to Buffalo exactly. and make a four hour concert into a 12 hour event? minimum yeah, i get that well i am excited you've got um you've got a ticket have you been following uh the tour and the set lists oh yeah yeah i've been i mean i haven't the last few i've i've not been because i just got so swamped with the kickstarter yeah. but i uh um i have the i did the nugs.net subscription where like i can listen to all the shows um yes and so I've been that's my like cooking dinner for the kids doing the dishes all that kind of stuff background noise. Yeah, what what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I'm liking it so far. It's it's one of those set lists it, and this has happened increasingly over the last few tours. Like the set lists do feel a little bit basic. Um and that's like it's not a serious criticism. It's like for hardcore fans, you'd really like to see some oddities 
in there. And uh, I think that probably the second leg of the tour will get some oddities. But like you also know that the vast majority of people who are going to a Springsteen show do not care that, you know, Prove All Night and Born to Run and, and you know, their favorite songs uh, have been on every set list since 1981. And they just want that song that night. Um, so uh, my only criticism is that I look at it and I'm like, man, there's uh, other than the brand new songs. There's almost nothing on here that wasn't on the last tour. Uh, but then again, the last tour was like 130 years ago. So I don't know that yeah. that's a real good, real complaint. You know, Russ, I, I, I really like your thoughts on that um, because it is that how does he build that that set list to kind of I mean, it's been, as you said, you know, a eon since they've toured. And yeah. I know that I've had multiple people on this podcast who are young fans who've never seen him live. And so mm -hmm. there, you know, so even if that's 20% of the audience, and I'm sure there's got to be even higher because of the anticipation, you know, it, I yeah. had someone say, I really don't need to hear Born to Run again, Jesse. And she, she meant that with, you know, with, she wasn't complaining. She was just mentioning. And I right. said, I, I get it. I said, but think of the person who's never been at a Springsteen show how disappointed are they going to be yeah. if they leave without hearing Born to Run? And and she said, I've never thought of it that way. From now on, I'm going to, when he plays Born to Run, I am be thrilled for every new person in that venue. And you and I know the saying, right? Yeah. Every comic book is someone's first comic book. Yeah, exactly. Every concert is someone's first comic book, and you've got to find it. I also think the set list, he is telling well, a story that he wants to tell. That's very true, yeah. And that's probably more true than it's been in a, in a long while. Like, it, it it feels like he's very inspired by the Broadway show in terms of, like, stringing and narrative together on, on every night. I think so, too. I, I think that really has influenced him. And like with the Western mm -hmm. Stars movie and then the Letter to You documentary, I, I think he mm -hmm. he has a vision of what he wants to say and do. I do think that he has had to play baseball manager and adjusted his lineup with the different yeah. uh, musicians being out at COVID. Like, OK, well, I've lost this person. I should do this and that. So yeah. it's it's going to be fun. Uh, well, good. I, I'd love to have you back after you hear it live and we, you give me a report. That'll be very fun. Yeah, for sure. So it's do, uh, and yeah. to, to your earlier point, sorry, not to talk over no, you, but no, I wanted no. to say this, like to your earlier point about every concert being somebody's first, uh, my town in particular is a great example of that as he has not been to Syracuse since Tom Joad. He has not done an E Street tour in Syracuse since Born in the USA, and it's a college town. And so our population turns over every 15 minutes. And so you figure like people coming here, or the band coming here, it, there's going to be people like old timers who haven't had a chance to see him since the 80s. And as you know, just because you have a chance doesn't always mean you can. You know, I could theoretically go to Buffalo, but the amount of money and time and everything else it would be, I, I just I can't do it right now. Um, and I so it's like minimum, you get a lot of people who don't do a lot of traveling who are going to be able to see him for the first time since born in the USA here. Yeah, I, I think that's really well said. And um, and the other thing that when people talk about this you know he's only doing two three songs from his biggest album i mean no surrender yeah. he's doing glory days he's doing dancing in the dark um you know there there are people that have been unhappy he isn't doing born in the usa right not not core yeah. uh, fans but others and so i think that's I, I, and we all as fans could say, oh, you know, if I had the magic bullet and build my set list, um, yeah, we'd right. all have different things we want to hear. But, you know, you've got to try to miss, you've got to try to make everyone, you know, enjoy 
the experience, whether you're an experienced fan yeah. or this is your first time. Yeah, yeah, one of my first concerts when I was when I was like 13, uh, I went to see the Stones during Voodoo Lounge. Yeah. And I, I very distinctly remember having this conversation with my dad where it was like, uh, once you've been doing this for 30 or 40 years, there's literally no way that you can play all of your hits in a set list and not have it just feel kind of boring because you're just basically playing the greatest hits album with absolutely no breaks for anything else because you've had you have 28 top 10 hits um and you know bruce is in that same position bruce is in this position where it's like you know there's four songs off of born to run and three songs off of born in the usa and three songs off of darkness that just never leave the set list and so at what right. point when you're playing 30 songs uh do you just sit there and go you know we don't have a ton of wiggle room yeah, because um, you want to get some of the letter to you. Um, he's mm -hmm. enjoying doing the covers album. Um, I would have loved a Western Stars, but he just didn't have, you know, room for it or, you know, and so it it is I, I it's it's kind of interesting, this challenge and how do you make everyone happy and the issue I always get a kick out of is um, if you ask someone, well, what song would you take out? Everyone would pick a different song, you know, and I yeah. thought oh, about yeah. I've thought about doing an episode where or, or posting this on the uh, my website, like, OK, what 10 mm -hmm. songs do you think? should be constant no matter what on a bruce springsteen right. you know show and and i think everyone would have a different 10 i think there'd be two or three that are the same but yeah it, it would be oh, it, sure. it's really tough yeah but even then as as you alluded to there are certain people like i you know it's funny that you talk about people being upset that born in the usa is not played here because i remember the last tour people complaining that born in the usa was on every single night and yeah. you know and so it's like it's one of those things where you you get all those different answers and you might be surprised that somebody leaves off, you know, Thunder Road or Born to Run or something that you assume would be on everybody's ballot. Yeah. And well, I think there's also a there's an inherent bias to like people. If you ask them right now what needs to be on every on, on every show uh, right now, people are going to say Thunder Road because it's not on the set list every night. And so uh you're, you're going to take something off to accommodate that but every other tour where it's been on on the on the set list every night people would have taken that off to accommodate you know prove it all night or you know whatever there's always there's always going to be one massive hit that's not on the, the, the set list and then you're going to be like oh but my my recency bias tells me that you know born to run doesn't need to be on because it's been on so much <laughs> yeah uh, my first seven shows i did not hear thunder road live just mm -hmm. just because my first show was in 2002 just the way it worked the only song i've heard every time i've seen him and i'm up to 19 is the rising mm -hmm. uh, you know uh yeah. and so um and so now that i kind of want that streak to happen one i love the song the rising but i just love that that's the song that because you know people oh what's well, born to run well no not because he didn't do born to run when he was doing the devils and dust and that was the second show i saw right yeah well i i can't wait for you to experience and go this is going to be wonderful um we're going to switch gears yeah, I'm, I'm excited and it go ahead I was just going to say, and as, as like, again, as we get closer and closer to the Buffalo show, I just sit there and kick myself like, oh, I should have just done it. I should have just done it. It's like, I, I know for a fact, I'm going to be so picked at myself because I'm off next week too. Okay, <laughs> um, but, yeah. But, you know, I'm off because I'm supposed to be working on a book. <laughs> yes. Well, that is a perfect lead in. Um, you, uh, we, the, when you're on before, um, you were doing a campaign of your book about Josie and the Pussycats. It was an amazing book yeah. and so much fun. I you, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. You did so much about, you know, the greatest movie ever made and you did, uh, it, it was just such a fun experience. 
And so you're now switching gears. You are working on a second book, but it you're mm-hmm. going to an unofficial oral history of Legends of Tomorrow, which is yeah. the uh, Arrowverse um, team uh, series, I guess is what I would call it. Um, tell me a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a there's a few things that happen, and and there's a really circuitous road that took me to to doing Legends next. Uh, one of the ideas that I I had this like giant spreadsheet that I started creating during the Josie book, and uh, I was like, man, I love this format. I love doing an oral history where the people who made the thing get to essentially speak for themselves. You know, the the nature of the book is I'm not in it, quote unquote, that much. Like I have connective tissue that I write. And I get to choose the framing and I get to choose like what things to juxtapose if I think they're funny together and stuff. But other than that, uh, it's it's not me talking. The idea, the appeal is that I'm giving voice to the people who made the thing. And so while I was doing Josie, I started making this big list of like, what are other things that I would like to do this with? And uh, <clears throat> some of them uh, that are on the list, I'm still going to get to one day. Some of them uh, have already in the space of the last two years become impossible. Like uh, a a good example is uh, I I was thinking about trying to do Hudson Hawk. And unfortunately, because of Bruce Willis's situation, there's just no reasonable way to do an oral history of Hudson Hawk where he's the the movie biggest booster and its star and its producer. Um, and, And so like that one falls off the list because I just don't think that I could do it justice. Uh, but so I, I had, I decided I wanted to do a book about crisis on infinite earths, which is a comic book miniseries from the 1980s that then also became kind of the massive culminating event of the Arrowverse in 2019, 2020. And so I started doing it and I was going to say the first third was going to be about the comic book miniseries. The second third was going to be kind of a primer on the Arrowverse so that people understood the context of the third part, which was the TV event. And as I got into it, a handful of things all kind of happened at once. Um, George Perez, who had drawn the original comic book, passed away. And I really did not want to be bothering George's friends and family for recollections about crisis while his passing was really fresh. Uh, And uh, Ruby Rose made a battery of allegations about how badly everybody was treated on the set of the Arrowverse shows, and she says she's going to elaborate on those allegations in an autobiography that she's writing next year. Um, and and for something that's generally a very positive thing, like I, I want to celebrate the art behind this, uh, and that doesn't mean that there's no criticism of it. That doesn't mean that the people involved are above criticism, uh, but it does mean that like. If there's something very, very negative, I want to have a holistic look at that before I jump in. Like, I don't think that uh, Ruby Rose would talk to me. And I think that inherently, uh, if I don't have at least her book to look at where I can include some version of what she says, then it's going to seem like I avoided that thing because I'm being a shill. And that's not Mm -hmm. what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, and then kind of the most important part, honestly, was just that as I was doing working on the middle section, because I couldn't do the first and I couldn't do the last, um, I started, uh, I was like, I was talking to everybody about the shows and I just started falling in love with like revisiting Legends, which is my favorite of the shows anyway. Um, but I get along with the casting crew really well and everybody has really fun stories. Uh, and I just remember at one point, I uh, they released a, a mixtape. They released a, like a digital mixtape that was all of the songs that uh, like original songs and, and some covers that appeared on the show. And I found out that a friend of mine, Jess Harnell, had been the guy they tapped to perform as Elvis in an episode where Elvis was because it's a time travel show. Right. And so... I was just like, oh, I got to talk to Jess about this. And I called Jess. I said, hey, you want to, can you talk to me for this book I'm writing? And he goes, sure, sure, sure. And we get on the phone. And he's like, so tell me about this book. And immediately I'm just like, your episode has absolutely nothing to do with the crisis book. <laughs> like, yeah. 
And and that was kind of the moment that I was like 100% sure, like, obviously, I'm writing a Legends book next. And then very, very quickly after that, it became uh, the show got canceled. And there was all of this outcry by the fans. And I just became like, why don't I write Legends first and let all of these problems with the crisis book sort themselves out over the course of a year and a half? Uh, and then <clears throat> I can come back to that one fresh after I've already done this thing that's like a celebration of this fun strange weird little show because again like you talk about the arrowverse and especially to people who don't watch these shows and don't really know what the cw's kind of shared dc universe of shows is uh, and you basically think of like superhero shows on tv as all being more or less the same thing um mm -hmm. because there's very constrictions and effects constrictions and there's just conventions of what those shows are uh and the thing that I love about Legends is that it, A, constantly reinvented itself, and B, almost none of those reinventions felt like a, a typical, like, network superhero show. <laughs> um, you know, it's this it's this thing about a bunch of time-traveling losers, and uh, they're all kind of trying to figure out where they fit in the universe – and so people come and go depending on their storyline, depending on what story is being told by the larger plot. And uh, it, it just – it's one of those things that I've – it's bound to be a cult classic. And so I decided like, well, in, instead of waiting 20 years like you know, I did with Josie, so to speak, I didn't obviously know 20 years ago that I was going to write that book, but like nobody else did it either. Um, and so instead of waiting 20 years – I was like, I'll just jump on while these stories are still fresh and while still while people still have a really clear memory of like what their experience was working on Legends. I I love the series. I, I really did. I um it it as as a fan, as they kept losing cast members, it became less fun for me because I loved the people that were in the show. And and that mm. made it tougher for me. But overall, I have very wonderful memories of the show. And I think they didn't take themselves too serious, but they also took the story serious. And so it, it really good. So I'm mm. looking forward to reading these stories about how they came up with this. And and this is a series that changed year to year um different cast members mm -hmm. came and joined the different storylines and um so this is going to be fascinating um talk about the kickstarter so you are in the middle of your campaign it ends i think in about 15 days according to the website i'm going to get this out shortly yep. so they can do it so talk about some of the different levels and and what people who want to back it can uh, get from this uh, in this campaign. Sure. So uh, very much like what I did with my first book, I'm crowdfunding it because I'm self-publishing. And a lot of that is honestly just because I want creative control over what the book. Uh, some of it is because I'm doing unofficial things, which means it's really hard to find a traditional publisher who is willing to put something out on a large scale and not be worried about whether Warner's going to get upset that you're writing about their stuff. Um, yeah. Now, nothing I'm doing would, would be illegal in any way, shape or form. It's just, you know, it's an oral history. It's long form journalism. Um, but anytime you create something with somebody else's IP in the, the subtitle, uh, big and super skeptical about that. <laughs> um, and understandably so. So uh, so the, the Kickstarter campaign is basically to pay for editing, book design, all of the things that a publisher would do normally uh, that I have like a creative staff that I worked with on the Josie book. And I'm going to bring almost everybody back to do the same things again this time. Uh, the things that uh, that are on offer, so to speak, you know, the, the big thing obviously is just pre-ordering copies of the book because that's that's the conceit like that's the idea of this. But also, um, <clears throat> we have some other cool stuff. I have very much like with Joe's, have some props from 
uh, legends because uh, when the show was shut down, a handful of their stuff went to a, a liquidation house in Vancouver, and they did uh, they did a bunch of auctions, and people would buy like props and wardrobe and stuff like that. And I have a lot of things where I was like, "Oh, here's thirty of some small thing. Let me get that because then I can sell thirty small thing during the crowdfunding campaign." So I have like labels for the in-universe fake brands of beer and whiskey and all that kind of stuff and i have um you know little pieces of clothing and i have the 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 gold leaf thing that julius caesar wore on his head and stuff like that um that's awesome in universe in, yeah and within within the the world of the show there's, there's a thing called bebo and uh bebo is essentially tickle me elmo it's a little teal muppet looking thing uh and in its first appearance, it was mistaken for a god by um, some Vikings, because if there was a teal talking toy that went back in time and was encountered by Vikings, they'd probably be pretty baffled by it. Um, and so uh, I actually have some of the fabric that they use to make the bee dolls. Um, and, and so I'm cutting that into little squares and mounting it. And it's very much like when I did the Josie thing, I had like little pieces of film mm -hmm. uh, and like where it's, where it's like, oh, you, I'll mount this on a card for you. And you can literally own a piece of the movie. And uh, I was trying to think of like, what could be similar to that for for Legends? Like, because it's not a film. It's not this has never been projected in 35 millimeter. There isn't owning a piece of the literal physical show. And so uh, I was like, oh, the Bebo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so like there's that. Um, I actually wrote a short film back 2020. Uh, I don't know if we talked about this when I was doing the Josie thing. Um, when the pandemic first started, I participated in this thing called 88. And Taylor Morden, who was the guy who directed the last blockbuster documentary, mm -hmm. uh, assembled 88 groups of fans and gave each group one minute of Back to the Future Part 2 to remake. Oh, wow. And so you had this. Yeah. So it was fascinating to watch because you ended up with this incredible odd cross section of looks and tones and people's interests and people's skill levels. And like some people did animation and some people did like little paper dolls and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, I was the scene with uh, with Jaws at the movie theater, like the big 3D Jaws that came down. Okay. And did him. Uh, but I but I didn't have a Jaws. and. So I used uh, a Mana puppet from the Muppet Show. Nice. Um, and so, so I enjoyed the hell out of doing Project Eighty Eight. And since the pandemic was happening, and uh, you know, the had just started, and everybody was in lockdown, and Legends, I think it just aired a season finale, and you didn't know when it was going to be back. And so, together a bunch of fans, and I was like, "What if we did like a Project Eighty Eight type thing?" for legends and so we did this thing called the two meow meow project because there had been an episode of the show called legends of to meow meow where one of the main characters gets transformed into a cat and ends up traveling through a bunch of alternate realities that were inspired by like tv parodies and stuff and and uh so i i got a bunch of people together and it's like everybody does their own little comedy sketch and those are like alternate universes that you know the show missed the first time essentially mm -hmm. and so uh i wrote I, the, I wrote one of the sketches and it was called cooped up <clears throat> and it was once again it was directed by taylor because taylor when i was talking to him about doing this lead thing he was like you know i'm friends with falk henschel and falk had played man on the first season of legends yeah and so, uh, like, if you wrote if you wrote something for Falk, like, I bet I could ask him to do it. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. I'll write something. And I didn't think it would actually happen. Um, but I sent a PDF along, and then a couple of days later, he's like, hey, this is Falk with a little bit of your stuff. I want you to way funnier because, like, I was trying to – I didn't know the guy. I was trying to be conservative. And so I wrote a story that was, like, kind of – quietly implying that maybe Falk's character was Hawkman, but like really he was just a guy 
like you, you know in in Falk's version like he's holding the mace and he's making overt references to the show and then at the end the wings come out oh, and that so is awesome yeah so we did this and it's a it's a comedy sketch the conceit of it is um at the beginning of the pandemic girl dumps him and he's just like sitting in his apartment in a bathrobe crying and he calls blockbuster video uh to see if they have legends of the fall that he can pick pick up uh at curb and so it was a strange little thing and and like they surprised they had uh c played hawk make a cameo like doing a face to break up with him at the mm-hmm. Which was not something that it was really going to happen. Um, but so I, uh, I'm making a limited run of that short available on VHS uh, mm-hmm. as part of the crowdfunding campaign because it's a short film, so it doesn't really like those don't get a physical release because it's like you're gonna you're gonna burn a run of DVDs and who's yeah. gonna buy it? You know, you gotta you gotta charge at least five six bucks to break even, and who's gonna pay six bucks for something that's seven minutes long exactly um but in a crowdfunding campaign and and doing it as vhs where it's like it's basically there as a collector's item not not just so that not so you can own the apple uh you know video mm-hmm. um and so like that's in there and like uh i i wrote it's funny i call this is my my second book in any way that's kind of meaningful but in between josie and now I did release something called the gold exchange and the gold exchange is a column that I did for years at a variety of different websites where I would every month talk to the people who were making the comic book booster gold director's commentary style interview. Nice. And yeah. And over the years they had all disappeared from the internet because I did it first at comic related, uh, which went under and then at blog at newsarama which is still there, but the, every couple of years they get sold off to somebody new and they basically completely reboot the blog and all the old stuff disappears to the ether. <clears throat> and so uh, for a long time, people with you know, Booster Gold fans would ask me like, hey, is there any way of getting those old interviews? And I always used to tell people, you know, someday I'll someday I'll make a book, but like right now they're all just in my email and it would be a pain in the ass. And so for as a stretch goal on the initial Josie crowding campaign, I was just like, Hey, boost gold fans come buy this book about Josie and the pussycats. And if we make X amount of dollars, I'll, I'll collect all the gold exchange columns and write some new intros. And I thought it was going to be like a super lazy cut and paste, like just to make like seven people happy. Yeah. Um, And of course I couldn't help myself. And I spent way too much time, too much money um, completely like I cleaned up so much stuff. I originally, I was just going to reprint everything as it was with its original introductions and then just write a new intro for the book. And instead I deleted all of that, all of the introductions and rewrote all new ones for everything. And then I like went through and removed, you know, cause it's in the Q and a format. So I had, I like went through and removed all, all the places where I would blog at news drama or comic related. And I replaced it all with my name and the creator's names. And, and it just, it was this massive undertaking that, that, I think actually was more of a pain in the ass than actually writing the Josie book. Uh, <laughs> and it was for like a $700 stretch goal or something because I'm a crazy person. Um, yeah. But so the, the gold exchange actually is now my best selling book on Amazon because oh, wow. uh, recently they announced that booster gold was going to get a TV show on HBO max. Yes. And, I do see uh, that. Yeah. I, yeah. And so I, uh, I, I, very aggressively uh, in those first few days after the booster announcement happened uh, was out there on Twitter being like, Hey, did you know somebody wrote a book about booster gold? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But so that's going to be because booster appeared in the finale of legends, only the series finale, which was kind of a bummer, but like it was a constant, like booster constantly hung over the show. It's like, it's a show about time traveling superheroes, most of whom are kind of screw ups, and that's Booster's entire thing. He's a time traveling superhero who is widely perceived as a screw up. Um, so it was always like, so when are we going to get Booster? When are we going to get Booster? And then we finally did in the series finale. Uh, not that they knew it was going to be the finale when they wrote it, but you yeah, know, the universe happens. Um, 
So like you can get copies of the gold exchange as part of your, like I have a, a couple of different buttons where it's like, you can get, you know, the book plus the audiobook plus, plus the gold exchange or like um, I did a, I've got a little, you, you would know this cause like you're, you're a comic book person. Um, I've had to explain the heck out of it a couple of times on more like straightforward podcasts, but uh, I have basically an ash can for the book. Oh yes. Um, it's like a little 30 page, no photos, spiral bound here at my house thing that looks at basically two episodes, like one fan favorite episode and then the series finale. And uh, the the ash can is something that I'm selling for relatively cheap, and that is going to ship like in April and May. Uh, so like the book itself is not going to be done and out until early next year. Mm-hmm. But if you buy the the ash can, you can have something almost immediately that shows you like, okay, here's a preview of what this book's going to be like, and you know, here's. 11 pages of people talking about here I go again, which is one of the most popular of the show. And then another eight pages of, uh, you know, people talking about the finale and then another 10 or so pages of kind of connective. So like, so that's like a fun thing, uh, that being out there just because, uh, I originally actually what I, 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 what I was doing and I am doing, but it, it kind of has been paused everything else in my life. Um, I put together this ash can as a little thing that I could sell for charity. Um, I was trying to do uh, a fundraiser for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And uh, so I put together the people involved with it. Hey, if I send you a title page, will you sign it? And they said, yeah. And so I did that. I started sending it out. But like now I've got to like send it out to somebody, have them mail it back to me, send it out to the next person. There's four people. And I'm on like person two and waiting for it to come back to me. But so the ones that are in the the crowdfunding campaign are unsigned. They're just like stuff that I'm sending out. But again, like I, I I know for a lot of people who have to wait a year or more for a crowdfunding thing, it's always like, oh man, you know, I paid for it when I was excited about it. And then by the time I get it, I've forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to do a few things. And so I have like the gold exchange and I have the ash can and a couple other little things where it's like, no, like you'll get that in, you know, one to three months when you're still excited. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I I really looking forward to it. Uh, As I said, I enjoyed your Josie book. And so I know with as much as I love the series, this is going to be a really fun, insightful um, because this series as we're, we're talking about right it it evolved and changed and and it very quickly found its voice and i think among a lot of fans of the Arrowverse, that this was consistently one that people loved the, and um and i do think that they were surprised when they were not renewed um because mm-hmm. it had just been such a joy for fans to listen to or watch so well, and also it, go ahead. It, the thing about the renewal, and, and I won't get into it here because I've said a lot of this stuff before, but like, yeah, th- there were consecutive years of year over year viewer growth, and so more people were watching Legends at the end of season seven than were watching during season five, which when you're that deep into a show, typically unheard of. Uh, yes, especially when you aren't doing a designated final season victory lap. And so, and not only that, but also as it increased, it then became like part of the upper, like 30 to 40% of the networks ratings wise. And so at a certain point, you're looking at it going like just on paper, it doesn't make sense to cancel a show that's in the top half of your ratings. Like, what are you going to do? Cancel 60% of the shows. And then of course the network got purchased by a company that was there to cut costs and increase margin and so they canceled something like 75 percent of all the scripted shows and are going to lean into reality and game shows and other things that are inexpensive to make and so uh it really was it was just the perfect storm of like bad stuff was happening at warner brothers which is the tv you know the studio bad stuff was happening at dc bad stuff Stuff was happening at the CW, and the, your your cancellation has almost nothing to do with the show itself. Yes, 
absolutely that makes sense all right so it is available uh go to um kickstarter the, right the the easy thing to do because I, I i own this website and i just set it up to redirect okay. you can the worst chris.com and that'll take you right to the kickstarter the worst chris yeah the worst chris uh at some point a couple of years ago, somebody made a joke on Twitter about Chris Pratt being the worst Chris, and a bunch of the Marvel actors got really up in arms and like went out of their way to defend him on social media. And so okay. I bought the website The Worst Chris, thinking that I'd do something funny with it, and I just never really got around to it. But I now I just own this weird website that it's kind of got a funny name. <laughs> and so when I needed a I, I bought some I bought some advertising on uh, the villain was right, which is a podcast I listen to. It's like a pop culture podcast. Yeah. And when the the woman who runs that podcast network was like, "Do you have an easy way for like? Is there something they can shout out? Because it's not super practical for them to say like, just go to Kickstarter and search you." Right. I was like, "Oh, give me a minute. I'm gonna redirect uh, uh, the worstchris.com." <laughs> I love that. I think it is great. And I'm urging everyone to check this out. We've got about um, about 15 days left. Um, this ends April 1st, correct? Yeah, it ends April 1st. Uh, my, my current goal, it's funny, uh, because I knew for sure that I was going to do this book come hell or high water. Yeah. Um, I made the goal really modest. I made the goal $1,000 just so that that way it would successfully fund yeah. and, you know, I could move forward. Um, right now, uh, I'm right about where budgetarily I wanted to be for the whole thing. Um, and I've got half the campaign left. Now, the way Kickstarter and crowdfunding campaigns in general work, you make a huge percentage of your money on the first and last two days. And so I didn't like because I'm halfway there doesn't mean uh, I'm going to double what's there now. But right. um but the nice thing is I'm kind of like anything that goes from here on out is like creating a, a cushion for me and also probably giving me breathing room to do some other weird, expensive, annoying project uh, <laughs> like I did with the gold exchange. That sounds awesome. I, I really appreciate it. Um, all right. This was great. This was so much fun. If someone wants to reach you to talk about tv or bruce um how what's your social media i'm just at russ burlingame on just about every platform except for uh instagram where there's a period between russ and burlingame because uh the minute i got i didn't have an instagram account for a long time and literally the day that i i got verified on my instagram and uh I have not been able to get Meta to fix it for me in spite of the fact that if you go there, it's just like one weird, creepy, digitized photo, and then their bio is very clearly copy-pasted from my old Twitter bio because it has like the names of my wife and kids in it. Oh, weird. Okay. Yeah, it's it's very strange. I mean, I, I assume that they were just like hoping that I was more famous than I really was, Then they probably are like camping on it in the hopes that I would offer them money. Uh, but uh, I I'm, I'm not rich enough to buy an Instagram handle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, exactly. Well, my friend, thank you so much. I continue. Absolutely. To thank you for having me. No, I appreciate it. I can't wait to hear what you think of the show when you see it live. And, yeah, I'm looking uh, forward to it. It's going to be my wife's first show. Uh, she is not as, as huge a Bruce fan as I am, but like because of his reputation as a live performer, she's always been like, you know, one of these days I want to go with you and I can see how excited you are and I can like see the live show and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm super excited about Syracuse because uh, she'll be doing this for the first time. Oh, she's going to love it. And I can't wait to hear. All right. Uh, listeners, go to the worst Chris dot com. Uh, check out yeah. the Kickstarter. Um if you enjoyed this series, you definitely want this book. Um, if you are ever going to binge this series, you want the book as a way to kind of get the inside scoop. So check it out. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, and listeners. I, I will say for – oh, sorry. No, 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 go. Uh, just jumping on to your thing about binging the series, uh, I, I recently – a friend of mine who's a comic book artist uh, – 
retweeted me and said, I haven't watched this show yet, but I liked his Josie book and like he makes the show sound cool. I'm going to check it out. And it made me think like, you know what I should do is I should go on and like next time I do a Kickstarter update in the next few days, I think I'm going to make like a, a watch list of like, here are the essential episodes uh, for people who, so it's like you get all the major plot points and you get to watch all the best ones. And yeah. that way, uh, you know, it takes you through seasons one and two when people generally didn't like the show quite as much as they did later. And then uh, once you get to the point where you're in love with the show, you can just stop going by my list and and watch it your own uh-huh. pace. That is a great idea. I, I that that is definitely needed. All right. Yeah. So that's uh that's my next update. Watch out for that. That sounds great. I appreciate it. All right, listeners, be safe, be kind, and we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. I'm about to play the credits and how to reach me. But I want to give a shout out to my patrons. Uh, These are the people that kick a few bucks in every month to help the podcast continue. So thank you to Mary, Chris, Anna, Terry, Dale, Steve, Stephen, Levi, Betsy, John, Bella, Crystal, Rob, Ghost of Floyd FD, Steve, Fernando, and Yetta. Thank you guys. You are my angels, and I appreciate you. If you want more information about becoming a patron of the podcast, uh, go to patreon.com and search for Set Lusting Bruce. Now, thank you, and here comes the credits. There we go, another episode. I'm about to go through a couple of things where you can reach me and give me feedback. Um, So if you want to skip this, I understand. But I do hope you check it out every once in a while. I'm available on Twitter at Jesse Jackson DFW. The show is available at SetLustingBruce. You can send me an email, SetLustingBruce at gmail.com. You can send me a voicemail at 469-249-2442. I am currently doing a few other podcasts, Perfectly Good Podcast, John Hyatt from A to Z, where Sylvan Groth and I discuss every John Hyatt song in alphabetical order. My Babylon 5 podcast is Last Best Hope for Conversation, where Lou, Karen, and I discuss every episode of Babylon 5 in chronological order. I still am doing Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast with my brother in time, Charles Skaggs. And then finally, How Many Podcasts, the only podcast on the internet that counts, where my buddies and I discuss pop culture. You can go to our Patreon page and support the podcast for as little as a dollar a month. You can go to our Facebook page, like, and please, please go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and leave a five-star rating and review for all of the podcasts that I'm doing. It's okay if you don't listen to them, but if you subscribe and rate, it really will make my day better. Thank you, and I will talk to you soon. You just heard the fun talking, hard rocking, music loving, album ranking, fan thinking, joy spreading, lyric reading, story sharing podcast that is the one, the only, Set Listening Bruce. The theme for Set Listening Bruce was written by David Rosen, used by permission.